Welcome to the sixth part of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead, Tales from the Final Day. This is the finale of the first season. I'll say it's been a great learning experience. I already look back at the first episodes and cringe at parts, but I think that's how you know you've learned a lot. Thank you for the encouragement again that everybody has given. I appreciate how you guys show your interest in this project and that motivates me to keep making these videos. I've commissioned a mug and an art poster to be released, hopefully by the time I release this video. So if you would like to support the project and in turn get a cool mug or a poster, uh, check out the links in the description. The art was done by my girlfriend and she's asked me to tell you she has her commissions open. So maybe you have a memorable Cataclysm character you'd like art of? If so, reach out to her in a link below, or you can support us through any of the merch. But we both get a better cut through direct art commissions, so don't hesitate to commission. I'll even make a deal where if it's a character from this challenge world, you get $5 off. That deal will continue for the next season too. Now. Let's get on with the last episode of the first season. It was the 17th day since the cataclysm began. Foster rose from his bed in darkness, opening the heavy curtains to see that it was late afternoon. Through the window, just a block away, he could see the smoldering ashes of the log house he'd burnt down. The fire had consumed dozens of zombies last night. He felt the pang of hunger, and walked out into the apartment hall, heading through the central staircase up to his rooftop solar kitchen. He stepped up to the line of solar panels and the kitchen unit that was below in their shade. Opening his fridge, he made a quick breakfast of canned chicken and jam, and washed it down with clean water. Over the next hour, he made a batch of cornbread and set it aside in his fridge planning to use it as an ingredient for other meals later. In the next few hours, he need to wash his bites over with antiseptic once again. The fight at the fire last night had brought his torso to near fatal condition, and he'd be lucky if it healed over within the week. Foster boiled water, refilling his two gallon jugs. Then he boiled up a large pot of broth using a dozen eggs and seasoning salt. Once the broth was ready, he turned it into a woods soup by adding spam and canned beans. The soup was full of protein and fats, and rich with tasty salt. Foster, now being a skilled chef, knew how to season his soup excellently, turning it into a delicious feast. He poured his big batch of soup into the mixed containers he had on hand, a two liter metal tank, a pair of plastic bottles, and a bowl. There'd be plenty of feast soup for tomorrow, too. Foster went back into his apartment refuge and leaned back in his armchair, opening the book through the lens. It was a book about nature. Slowly, the day faded to night as Foster's atomic lamp became his reading light. Around midnight, he fit a bookmark between his pages and paused to fill up again on food and water. His bandages seemed to be holding up well and didn't need to be reapplied yet. He finally finished the book at 4 a.m. With what he had learned, Foster crafted a metal hand axe out of a particularly good shaped piece of steel. It wouldn't be a good weapon, but it could help him do some woodwork, such as cutting down trees. He could even turn a forest into a log cabin. Foster began to set aside a spot in his apartment for stuff to bring down to the superbike. He pulled in a shelf from another apartment and started to load items up into it. Anything in this shelf would be set aside for his journey beyond this first month. 
spare medical supplies, any weapons he had up here, as well as batteries, would be in the first load down to the superbike. Foster washed his gore-soaked military backpack using some detergent and water he'd gathered from the apartment toilet tanks. He'd looted the sturdy military backpack off of a zombified soldier the day before. Now that the grime was off, he slung it over his back. He had the feeling he'd be using it for a long time. Foster had an outdoor survival guide, which had piqued his interest ever since reading Through the Lens. Now that he had a sense for the outdoors, he wanted to become an expert. If possible, his journey beyond this month could take him far away from the city, where he could go months between running into the undead. He read through the survival book until the sun rose. Foster wasn't tired, but he got up and had another bowl of wood soup. Just as he sat down to read his outdoors book on the rooftop, he realized his bandages were bleeding through, and so he went to his medical shelf, washed some more antiseptic over his torso wounds, and reapplied the bandages. Foster read on the rooftop until he reached level 4 survival, then went down into his apartment and slept. He awoke around 4 a.m., grabbed his atomic lamp, and went up to his kitchen to make some food. He drank some cranberry juice from the fridge and finished off the last of his wood soup. Today was another day spent reading on the rooftop. His torso was healing, but slowly. It seemed it would take days before he was back to normal. He went to sleep around 8 p.m. and woke again at 5 a.m. He applied some more antiseptic to his torso wound and bandaged himself up. He started to cook another broth from powdered egg and seasoning salt, then added more powdered egg and beans. He ate until he was full, leaving plenty of leftovers for the whole day. Foster reclined on his rooftop armchair and continued reading his outdoor survival book. Foster reached Survival 5, learning, among other things, which types of mushrooms were hallucinogenic and which were safe to eat. He'd also learned about how to grow plants properly and what parts of wild game were good to eat. Part of him considered just taking the superbike deep into the woods and building himself a cabin. He could live off of wild game and foraging, and even avoid cities entirely. From what he'd seen of the survivalist bunker, it was bordering a forest. After checking if it was clear, Foster could move in and supplement his canned foods with hunted game. Eventually, he could even become self-sufficient and build another solar fridge and freezer there. But those were possibilities beyond this month. There were still several days left before he planned to leave on his superbike for the world beyond. It was day, and Foster felt that his torso was well enough healed to head outside again. Today, he wanted to thin out some of the roaming zombies between the apartment and his motorcycle. If he was lucky, he could even reclaim the original garage where he had first found the superbike. He stepped out into the street below the apartment, meeting the cold gaze of a zombie child, and beyond that, a screecher zombie noticed his presence. At this distance, the screecher wouldn't cry out yet. It had to be excitably close to do that. So he lured the two zombies nearer, against the back of a cargo van. Taking down the zombie child first, he then sprinted across the street and into the alley behind the garage. He needed to lure the screecher further away so that its call wouldn't draw zombies right to the apartment. The screecher drew near, then made a powerful scream, shattering and destroying the window beside Foster. The scream dazed him, and he rushed away from the shrieking terror, only to run into a hail of thorny darts, launched by a thorny shambler just around the corner. He felt the dart's poison seeping into his blood, numbing him. He needed to take as few hits from these darts as possible. Dodging, putting a push between himself and the screecher, Foster jabbed at it with his pipe spear. Four powerful strikes, and the screecher collapsed into the bush. Foster kept smashing the body. There was no way he was letting the screecher ever get up again, even as the thorny shambler crept up on him. He was forced to leave the screecher's body in the bush. A skeletal dog came around the corner as well, and Foster bounded from the garage. These two zombies were slow enough that he could gain some distance. 
Foster escaped their line of sight and entered the garage's house to catch his breath. He checked himself over. His torso was no worse for wear, although his limbs were nicked and scratched from the fray. He caught his breath. He still had a lot of fight left. A few seconds later, he burst back into the garage, opening the door as the zombie dog slowly turned to notice him in the doorway. It approached, and Foster clung to the darkness of the house, and with two strikes, it was dead. Now, all that remained was the thorny shambler. Stepping into the doorway to the backyard, Foster stood there, waiting for it to approach. But the thing launched another poison dart into him. Damn, what else was he expecting? Foster spam back into the garage. The glass window beside him shattered as another unseen zombie arrived. Foster stabbed at the zombie through the broken glass as the thorny shambler climbed up and onto the jagged window sill. He stepped away from the window, and with three strong stabs, the thorny shambler collapsed into a puddle of sap, its sharp tendrils quivering, even in death. Foster pulped the two zombies, plant sap and blood splattering over the garage. He really should have moved those bodies outside first. Now the garage is covered in blood and sap. He stepped into the garage's backyard to make sure that there were no zombies remaining that had heard the screecher's call. He heard the sound of something large leaping behind a nearby fence. Looking past the fence, he spotted a feral hunter, a strong zombie, and a zombie dog. Dazed, he wandered back towards the garage and hardly noticed as a second feral hunter ambushed him from behind a tree. Blinded, he rushed back into the garage. This feral hunter leapt around the room, with Foster turning to jab it in every direction. With two strikes it was down, but the second feral hunter was already on him. He tried to get some distance, and stabbed it whatever it was at a good range. He backed up into the dark hallway as the zombie dog and strong zombie lumbered into the garage. Foster could hardly breathe, having fought off the two feral hunters already, and rushed out of the house's front door. He turned and killed the zombie dog, but there was no way he could fight the strong zombie while he could hardly breathe. It was dazed on top of that. He stumbled across the street, fighting off the grasping hands of the strong zombie. The zombie punched him in the torso, and bit him on the left arm. Foster turned at the edge of the cargo van, the strong zombie catching itself on the van's hood. Foster climbed up to safety as he saw a second zo strong zombie approaching. He caught his breath up here. The area was so close to being safe. He climbed back down and with renewed stamina, dodged away from the pair of strong zombies as he stabbed them down to the pavement. Now the street was clear again. Foster went to his apartment and applied a fresh bandage over his torso. His torso had taken some harm, but was no worse than it had been last night. He swallowed an aspirin for the pain. Then, Foster went to sleep. He awoke at 8.40 p.m. at dusk. The sky was still dimly lit by the falling sun. He had a quick breakfast of leftover soup, then descended back down to the street. With the nearby zombies dead and the garage once again secured, he decided it was time to move the superbike back into the garage. He killed two zombies out in the field. The superbike was still in perfect condition. He looked it over, he had been wondering if it had a muffler, and confirmed that it did. Then he stepped on and slowly drove it round back into its original garage. Every window into the garage was now shattered. What was once a pristine and orderly garage had been profaned by the undead. As he stepped into the house, he heard the sound of movement from one of the rooms he had not explored earlier. He left it for now. Foster dragged the bodies out of the hallway and moved a shelf into the garage. He could use these shelves to barricade the room, giving it at least a little bit of defense while he worked on a long-term solution. He shoved one shelf into the garage's doorway to the backyard, but as he did, the sound of dragging the shelf but as he did, the sound of dragging the shelf must have agitated the zombie that was in the unexplored room. It smashed the window, and so Foster pushed aside the shelf through the door and stepped towards the zombie. It was a firefighter zombie, 
which Foster easily stabbed to death after it got itself caught up in the bushes outside the window. Foster cleared the broken glass from inside the garage and shifted the garage shelves so that they offered some simple protection. He looked over the garage and knew that this was nowhere near good enough if he wanted to be able to work on the superbike in safety again. Foster decided to board up all the garage windows to seal up the superbike and make sure it would last the 10 days that remained until he planned to depart. He got his toolbox from his apartment and gathered planks and nails from broken doors. He nailed planks over the garage's three windows, and for the door he put up a simple curtain. It would probably be fine. The most important thing was to make the garage invisible to any zombies that might wander the street or the field behind the garage. Once the garage was sealed visually from the outside, he flashed his flashlight on and scanned the garage room. It was a mess to think this room had once been pristine. Now it had multiple dead zombie corpses and was splattered with blood and green sticky sap. Foster dragged the bodies outside. He'd rather not have to see nor smell their rotting corpses as he worked on his dream of a future. With the bodies gone, he pushed the shelves back against the walls. Foster looked over his bike, now with the time to consider what he would add to it. He could make a mini freezer, which could then be removed once he arrived at the bunker. Since the bunker wasn't too far, he could even make multiple trips to bring all of his solar panels too. Looking over his map, he noticed that just a small patch of forest separated the two large fields. His superbike was nimble, and he could probably drive it through at least a short patch of forest with ease. There was even a dairy farm just beyond, which could have cows that he could butcher. With a running freezer, he could even freeze their meat so that it didn't go to waste. The more he thought about it, the more Foster began to think that his apartment was more ideal than the bunker. Sure, the bunker would be away from the city, but with the success he'd been having lately with killing zombies, maybe staying in town long term wasn't all that bad of an idea. He could go on an early scouting run to check out the dairy farm, and even slaughter a cow bringing its meat back to the apartment to make some nutritious meals. Hamburgers, steaks. Foster had an appetite for better food than spam soups and oatmeal. But it wasn't as simple as just going to the dairy farm and killing a cow. To butcher a cow, he'd need to prepare some butchering tools, and that meant more than just a good knife. Ideally, he would have a butchering rack, but there had been no such thing at the apartment. Instead, he figured he would just hang the carcass from a tree. That would give him a good enough angle that it would be easy to carve the meat off the carcass. Foster crafted a long rope by tearing up some curtains into rags and then binding the rags together into short ropes, then combining those ropes into a long rope. He also made a simple wooden table. The table was portable enough that he could bring it with him, it would help him carve up some of the larger pieces. He also packed a multi-tool with a strong saw. A cow has a large carcass and therefore also requires a tool with either wood sawing or metal sawing to get through the bone. The multi-tool has both. With the long rope, portable table, and multi-tool in hand, Foster was ready to get some meat. He grabbed his makeshift wood axe in case he would need to clear any foliage on his superbike's path through the forest. It was 3.20 a.m., long before dawn. He revved up the superbike's engine and set off across the field towards the dairy farm. The last burger he'd eaten had been some leftovers he'd found in someone else's fridge. It was time for some fresh meat. He rode his superbike north around the perimeter of the city. The path was clear of any zombies, and approaching the patch of forest that he had to pass through, he was fortunate to find a thin path directly through. He arrived at the dairy farm and used his headlights to scout around. It seemed entirely clear. The cows were safe. He parked the superbike and left its headlights on, facing towards the cows. Then he climbed over the fence into their pasture and searched the farm buildings. 
There was a farmhouse here and a milking parlor. Both were empty of any undead creatures. In the house, Foster found some items, including a butchering knife, far better than the multi-tool he planned on using. He also found a wood saw that was even better suited for butchering, too. The cows wandered around, watching him with their baleful eyes. It had probably been weeks since they saw their last human, maybe longer. These were dairy cows. In the old world, they would live to around five or six years before being sent for slaughter. Their meat, considered lower quality than a beef cow, would normally go into hamburgers, but Foster wasn't picky. Dairy cows can weigh as much as 900 kilograms, being much heavier than Foster can carry or even drag with his superbike. But he had an idea. He cut a hole in the pasture fence, then chased a cow through the hole and into the woods. Then, Foster stabbed it through with his spear, ending the bovine's short life. Foster brought his superbike over to the dead cow, then, tying the rope around its body, he hoisted it up around a tree, using his superbike as counterweight. With the carcass hanging in the air, it would be much easier to carve up. Foster placed the table on the ground, and began to butcher the cow. He removed the entrails first, letting the blood pour out of the beast and seep into the forest soil. The full butchery took nearly two hours, but in the end, Foster had piled up an enormous amount of meat, hide, and sinew. He loaded his superbike's rear wire basket up to its capacity with bloody chunks of raw beef. There was still a lot left, and he'd have to come back for at least another trip. He saw a giant spider. If anything were to kill the other dairy cows in the future, it would probably be some sort of mutated forest creature like this. But that was a problem for another day. Foster had a lot of meat he needed to put in the freezer. It took a lot of trips up the stairs, and one trip back to the cow's carcass. He left the bones next to the forest and brought its hide with him. In his solar-powered freezer, he added up a total of 144,300 calories of meat. That's about 48 days at 3,000 calories per day. He also had another 273,066 calories of fats. That's another 91 days. Plus with the brains, kidney, liver, sweetbread, and other scraps, Foster was set for a very, very long time, and that was just from one of the ten cows. He'd also brought the cow's raw hide and stuffed that into the freezer as well. Using kitchen salt, he could cure it later so that it wouldn't rot. Then, it would just be a matter of effort to tan the hides, and Foster would have a bunch of cow leather too. Now, I like realism. That's one thing I enjoy the most about Cataclysm. It manages to illustrate a semi-realistic survival simulation. And so I did some research on how many calories a real-life dairy cow could give if eaten whole to see if it was close. It turns out Cataclysm is actually pretty accurate in how many calories a cow has, including all of its edible parts. If anything, a real-life dairy cow could have up to 20% more edible calories than what Foster was able to get here. But that's including the hide and some other organs which you're probably not going to want to eat if you can avoid it. So in total, Foster has food for half of a year from just one cow. And there are ten cows here. If he were to butcher them all and freeze them, he could survive on the meat from this one farm for five whole years. Even longer if he let them perform mitosis. Mitosis, you ask? Well, one thankfully unrealistic thing about Cataclysm is that animal husbandry is simplified. Animals multiply, seemingly by mitosis. A cow will clone itself given enough time, becoming two cows, and those two can become four. I like to imagine this is because of Cataclysm's weird science. Perhaps cows in Cataclysm have been genetically altered, or have some sort of a reproductive implant. 
Best not to think about it too much. Foster seared up a stack of cooked beef, enough for at least the day. The delicious and filling fatty protein tasted like a gift from the gods. Foster ravenously devoured the juicy, fatty meat. With his fridge stocked full of perhaps the best type of food imaginable, Foster once again had nothing but time on his side. Nine days before his mission to survive a month was complete. He settled down and read through a tailoring book, Sewing Techniques for Designers. He was level four tailoring, and this book could bring him up to six, but it would take a few days to work through. He figured the book would be able to teach him much about how he could use the cow leather that he'd obtained. Eventually the sun set, and Foster filled up on cooked meat again and went to sleep. In the morning, Foster got right back to reading. He realized his bandages needed to be reapplied, and so he washed his bites over with antiseptic once again and bandaged his torso and left leg over. Then he sat back down to read and rest. Foster studied his sewing guide, bookmarking the patterns that seemed most useful. With these, he could put together some clothing truly worthy of the cataclysm. He spent the next morning tanning hides using kitchen salt. Then he made some lard out of the cow's raw fat. The last thing he needed to tan the hides was some boughs from pine trees. He'd need to search the woods. It was day, and Foster traveled to the north woods, behind the shack where he used to park the superbike. As he headed into the woods, a fused assembly of zombies spotted him. It seemed to be alone, and Foster was in healthy enough condition to engage it. He stabbed at it while keeping distance, aiming for the thing's many heads, and avoiding its dozens of grasping hands and limbs. The mass was incredibly resilient, and it became apparent that this open field wasn't doing Foster any favors. Breathing hard, Foster retreated out of the field and towards the buildings in the apartment street. The scrapped hatchback, which he had scavenged a week ago for parts, was the perfect obstacle to tip the fight in his favor. He dodged around it as the zombie mass got stuck on the hood. Foster jabbed it feverishly, and before long, the creature's many bodies were dead. Now the forest was more clear. Foster reapplied bandages and washed his wounds with antiseptic down on the street, and then began to forage for pine trees. He chopped the boughs of the pine trees that he came across until he had a great big bundle of boughs. Pine needles are high in tannins and make for a suitable tanning chemical. They were exactly what he needed to tan the cow hides. Returning to his apartment, he began to smother his cured hides with lard and boiled the pine needles into some water. He soaked the cured hides in this mixture, then hung them up on the apartment rooftop. They would finish drying overnight. He went to bed as the sun fell. In the morning, he unrolled his fully tanned hides. With the hides prepared, he set to sewing together leather chaps and then leather pants, two layers of protection for his legs. He then made leather arm guards and a balaclava from some rags. The leather arm guards replaced his scrap arm guards from before and were lighter with a similar level of protection. His leather chaps and pants replaced his jeans, which had been ripped and torn and the ragged balaclava replaced his firefighter's PBA mask, which had been giving him trouble breathing during fights. He read the book Archery for Kids. He wasn't a kid, but it did teach him how to make simple arrows and got him thinking about archery. He crafted a short bow and then looked through the book's pages for modifications he could add. It seemed like only larger bows could be able to take on mods such as arrow rests or stabilizers. Foster's mind wandered to think about the gun store, just across the field east of the apartment. He hadn't explored that way, but a gun store itself could be extremely useful, especially if it had a bow, which would be a powerful weapon for clearing areas of town while creating as little noise as possible. 
With his skills in fabrication, he could make all sorts of improvements for any ranged weapons. He decided to go at night. For now, he read the book all about swords until night fell. Then, in the darkness, he hopped on his superbike, flicked the headlights on, and drove across the east field to the gun store. It was easy to forget just how many zombies were down here on street level, since Foster had cleared the zombies on the streets nearest to his apartment. Anywhere that was further away was still crowded with the shambling undead. The greater city of Sprague was still extremely dangerous. He noticed an atomic car on the road in front of the gun store, with its plutonium cell still intact. It even seemed to be making a rumbling noise, which began to draw the attention of nearby zombies. Perhaps it had just recently been turned on by a zombie activating the ignition by chance. This was fortunate. With the zombies distracted by the rumbling car, Foster could slip into the gun store unnoticed. He slowly drove the superbike up beside the front door and turned the bike off. Foster inspected the gun store entrance. It seemed to be tightly boarded up. Whoever owned the gun store before the cataclysm must have been trying to protect it from any last looting or squatting attempts. The zombies were distracted by the atomic car, and so Foster started to bash the boards in with the back of his pipe spear. A few bashes and he was through. There were no undead in the gun store. He searched around spotting the weapons that remained in their locked glass display cases. Of course, these must have been the last guns and ammo in stock because neither guns nor ammo matched each other. If he was lucky, they might match something he had at home. With the gun store thoroughly searched, it was time to break into the glass displays and get the guns. This would make a lot of noise, possibly enough to bring the horde of zombies that was attacking the atomic car outside. He'd want to move as quickly as possible. Foster sprinted through the gun store, smashing the glass displays that still held the guns and ammo, taking the items within. Within seconds, he was already out on his bike, heading back to his apartment faster than any zombies could react. He was home. Foster brought all the guns and ammo upstairs to his apartment refuge. He compared the ammo and guns to what he had on hand. Foster figured that the Remington 223 ammo he'd picked up could fit in his M4A1 carbine, which also used 223 bullets. This gave him a considered total of 54 bullets for the weapon, more than enough to get him out of one or two bad situations. He reheated some cooked beef, then settled down to finish the book all about swords, bringing his cutting weapon skill up to one. Then he read Boxing Monthly and brought his unarmed combat skill up to one as well. He also read the book Trap and Field, which brought his shotgun skill up to one. Foster had just over five days left until the month was over. He slept and set his alarm to wake him up at midnight. Tonight, he planned to make a pit. He realized it would be useful to have at least one trap that he could use when fighting zombies in the north field. After all, he was making the decision to live here for the long haul. Traps would give him more ways to make the nearby streets into his home turf and help him fend off the constant stream of wandering undead. He carried his atomic lamp downstairs. Foster started to dig using an entrenching tool. As he removed the soil, he heard the sound of shuffling movement, almost like something dragging itself along. The weak murmurs of countless voices were clear in the night air as a disolluted devourer stepped into the dim edge of his lamplight. He stopped digging and quickly brought about his pipe spear. He lured the devourer south and towards the cargo van while taking turns to jab it. He brought the thing into the van and dashed around the side to appear to it again in front of the cargo van's window. The devourer dragged itself up and into the van, chasing his appearance at the front windshield. 
the Devourer feebly struck at the van's windshield as Foster caught his breath on the other side. When he was ready, he went behind the cargo van and stabbed the thing's many bodies until it at last crumpled under its own weight. Foster continued digging until he had removed hundreds of pounds of soil. There was now a deep pit in the middle of the north field, a pit he could use to trap any zombies, luring them into falling in, where they could be easily dispatched. Foster then went across the street on the other side of the apartment. He hadn't spent as much time clearing this west side street, but there were no zombies in sight, so Foster went into the house across the street. Weeks ago, he had spotted a cannabis greenhouse behind this house. He passed through the house into the backyard. Through the greenhouse window, he spotted a zombified dog, then second and third zombified dog stuck inside. These poor hounds had probably been left after their owner died or was forced to abandon them. Perhaps due to starvation, the three had died and now were possessed by the same necromantic life as the rest of the world. He readied himself, then opened the reinforced glass door to let the dogs out. Foster moved backwards into the house, stabbing at them as he could. One dog was down. He lured the second one inside the house, rushing behind it to shut the door, isolating this one zombie dog from the other. Once this dog was down, he caught his breath as the third zombie dog scratched at the window, then opened the door and finished the last dog off. The greenhouse was made of reinforced glass, an incredibly tough material. This would be the perfect place to start a farm, as it was directly across the street from his apartment. Anything he planted in this greenhouse, he could be sure would be safe to harvest. He planted some tomato and wheat seeds, but there was more space here than he had seeds. He remembered that a farm was nearby. Perhaps he could go there when it was dark and see if there were any seeds left there at the farm. Foster collected some more water from the apartment's toilet tanks, scooping it up into a large canning pot. He hauled it up to the rooftop and boiled it, filling two one-gallon jugs. There was time still until it was night, so Foster decided to craft some mods for his M4A1 carbine. He started with an adjustable stock. It was a difficult thing to craft, and Foster ended up wasting a lot of the materials but he did finish it and attached his adjustable stock to his M4A1 carbine. He also made a sling and then attached that onto the carbine as well. Night fell as Foster read his book, The Art of Glass Blowing. He went down to the street level and in the darkness of this cloudy night, he made his way to the nearby farm. It was desolate with just a few strands of wheat remaining. He took the wheat and brought it back to his apartment. He'd learned how to turn wheat into seeds, and did so for some of the wheat. He harvested the cannabis outside of the reinforced grow-up and planted wheat there instead. He decided to make flour out of the wheat and made himself a quern out of a good-shaped rock. With just a quarter of the wheat, he was able to make five and a half liters of flour. Foster would be eating very well in this last week. He put his fresh flour into the fridge and cooked up some more beef. Foster returned to his book, The Art of Glass Blowing. The name of the book sold it short. It contained a depth of information about how to fabricate things with mastery. If he read through it, he could get up to level 7 fabrication. He reached fabrication 6 before he went to sleep. He awoke and went up to get some food for breakfast. Some of his cooked meat was rotting in the fridge, and Foster tossed it off the rooftop's edge. Foster watched the time pass as he read more of his book. He watched the sun set on this 29th day through the window of his apartment. The challenge of this playthrough was to survive for a full month, and Foster is almost at that mark with no visible threats to his existence. So it's only fitting that Foster cook up something extra special to celebrate. What better food to cook than a supreme pizza? 
with fresh milled flour, beef, dehydrated vegetables, cheese spread, and red sauce. It was a magnificent feast. But that's not all. It was a full day of celebration. Next, he made himself a sorbet out of compote and cranberry juice. He could have frozen the sorbet before eating it, but eh, Foster is Foster. He drank his sorbet and was sated. Satisfied, Foster returned to reading The Art of Glass Blowing until he was hungry again. He then made himself a second sorbet and put it in the freezer this time. He made a double cheeseburger and devoured it. Then he drank some chocolate drink and a crispy cranberry soda. Then he went to sleep. He awoke. Today is the final day of Foster's challenge. He spent the day relaxed in his apartment. His wounds from the fights over the last week were still etched on his skin. If he moved the wrong way, his torso let him know. For breakfast, he had another cheeseburger, and for lunch, he had a now frozen sorbet. And sure enough, the date counter on his electronic watch ticked forward. It was day 91. He had survived 30 days in this cataclysm. Foster's future is left unknown. I've uploaded his save game, so if you want to play through this game from here onwards, feel very welcome. Foster has his entire apartment building as a safe refuge. His tower, the tallest building in his city of Sprague, watching over the dead city before him. There must be thousands of zombies throughout Sprague, but there must also be a way for Foster to reclaim his future and to build a world out of its remains. After all, he survived the first month, and he was just Foster. There must be others who survived by chance as well. With other survivors, together, they could rebuild civilization. Foster's victory gave him hope that despite the difficulty of this cruel, cataclysmic world, there was still a chance for the future. With his superbike, he could travel beyond Sprague to see if there were survivors elsewhere. Traveling the highways and roads, Foster imagined he would eventually find a community given time. There must be others somewhere. He would just need to be careful and always have a route back home. Or perhaps Foster himself would be the beacon, calling other survivors towards his apartment paradise. He could search high and low for solar panels and car batteries and expand his solar energy system. He knew where to find cows he could even bring them into a safe place and grow cattle. By chance, Foster had stumbled over the fortune of the apartment building's sanctuary, then the bounty of the dairy farm as well. Foster had something special, something that countless others had died without. But that is enough of the story of Foster Punch Meyer. I hope you have enjoyed this tale. In terms of the challenge part of the series, I'll declare Foster victorious, he survived a full 30 days. I've uploaded a new version of his save file in case you would like to continue Foster's story on and play as him for yourself. Let's remember the first character in this season, Justin Roses. It's been a while since I've said that name. He was a mechanic, but had the misfortune to start the cataclysm in the hospital and was surrounded by zombies in the darkness. He survived for just two minutes. A stark reminder that while Foster succeeded, this cataclysmic world can be a cruel place. To go over Foster's story, Foster began at the top of an apartment building and cleared out the building. His largest accomplishments were making a full solar kitchen and running over or burning about 78 zombies around the middle and end of the month. He ended the challenge set up extremely well with a superbike and in the process of clearing his neighborhood. I know I could have made him escape the apartment, but I feel it suits Foster better to stay. He's an engineer, or at least became one during the cataclysm. It's possible that over the next months, Foster would clear the city out and be able to loot its richest resources. Foster was a lot of fun to play. He was good at combat from the beginning. Having that mall cop, baton, and Krav Maga training was really helpful. The taser was useful too in that it had an extra battery that helped him work a makeshift arc welder to get the solar fridge built. 
mall cop is a useful profession in Cataclysm. I found with the rooftop apartment start, I was able to just lure the zombies off the edge, which saved me from taking a lot of damage. I barely had to fight any of the zombies inside the apartments. Vertical space helps you out a lot against zombies, and having built a sledgehammer to break the only stairs the apartments had, Foster was safe within the first week. Having a safe haven is huge in this game. A simple stepladder is one of the most powerful items. From there, it was all about survival simulation and passing the time while preparing for the future. Getting water was easy because of all the toilet tanks in the apartments, and there was plenty of food in each of the apartment's kitchens. There were about 40 kitchens total, which is just amazingly bountiful. I don't know how any other starts will play out. I think I'm in for a really difficult challenge next season. Foster will probably always be one of our more fortunate survivors. What I appreciate most about Cataclysm is the depth of survival simulation it offers. Playing through a full in-game month takes you to some places you wouldn't expect, all of which are grounded in the somewhat realistic rules of the game. You need food, water, and shelter to survive, and everything stems from those basic needs. There were so many times where I thought I had everything figured out, particularly after destroying the stairwell to the apartment, but the game kept throwing unexpected detours at me. Some extra materials for the solar fridge, or the discovery of the superbike. I'm sure that if I played onwards for a full year, there would continually be new and immersive problems to solve. For instance, one of the early things Foster did to achieve his needs was to make a solar kitchen, a fridge and freezer that ran off of solar panels. Building the solar fridge was a huge mission on its own. It made Foster have to leave the safety of the apartment building to find working car batteries and a bunch of other tools and materials just to construct it. Foster's survival became linked to building the solar fridge, and eventually he was able to use it to freeze more than a full season's worth of beef. It's this sort of emergent storytelling that was created out of the rules of the game that I find so damn cool. There's a mission, and when you finish it, you can really feel how much you gained from completing it. It's really fun to create a story like this because I'm not choosing exactly what will happen. Instead, I try to play out Foster's point of view. He needs food, shelter, water, and I act as Foster's best attempt at reaching those things. I talk about Foster in the third person because, in a way, there is a Foster that is separate from myself. He's his own character in his own world that I can guide on his path to his destination. It's something I appreciate about writing a story about a character in a roguelike game. There's a lot of unpredictability to what can happen. The real author is the game. I'm just its interpreter. I should also take some time to talk about the stock footage I use. It's all free stock footage from a site called pexels.com. That's P-E-X-E-L-S. This project benefits from the generosity of videographers who have decided to publish some of their footage for the public on that platform. It's such an easy resource to use, and if you have video projects, I would really recommend checking it out. I have a special appreciation for the accounts Cotton Bro and Kelly Lacey there. Both have made some great footage for a range of subjects, including post-apocalyptic scenes. I figure it's worth it to advertise our merch again. We have a mug available which has the words Cataclysm, Dark Days Ahead Tales from the Final Day, and a background with some collapsed urban buildings and some zombie silhouettes mixed in. That was an idea that my girlfriend and I imagined into existence. Soon we'll have an art poster as well. I'm especially excited about the art poster. It will depict the inferno that Foster started on the fifth episode. It's a moment in the story that I found particularly awesome, with Foster looking on at the mass of charred zombies having merged together into one gigantic creature. I've also mentioned that we are offering art commissions with $5 off for Cataclysm characters. This is a great way to support us and get something for yourself as well. With commissions, it's all digital, so you don't have to pay to get a mug made and delivered out to you. The money from commissions all goes to us and this project. 
I'd recommend picking a memorable character that you've played through before and describing their appearance to us, and we can give you a vivid rendition. So with all that said, thank you for a great first season. I've learned so much from making this in terms of video production, and your feedback and presence as an audience has been an excellent fuel source. So thank you for the feedback, constructive advice, or even your silent presence. The comments you guys post about being excited for new episodes means a lot to me. You've successfully motivated me to spend the dozen hours it takes for each episode. I hope you've enjoyed what I think is a unique narrative telling of this Cataclysm game. I think the combination of stock footage, gameplay footage, and movie footage is something especially well suited to this zombie genre and a great way to tell a story in a roguelike game. After all, we're really just making our own Dawn of the Dead fanfiction. So take care, be well, and I look forward to the next season of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead Tales from the Final Day, where we will send out another group of survivors into an even more challenging world and see how they survive. Take care.